Hi, everybody. This is Non-Duality Talk. It's September 27th, 2015. I'm Jerry Katz. My guest is Dr. John Prendergast. John's a retired professor of psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies and a psychotherapist in private practice in San Rafael, California. He's led self-inquiry groups for over a decade and offers workshops and retreats. John's website is listeningfromsilence.com. Hello, John Prendergast. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having having me on your program, Jerry. My pleasure. Um, I want to continue the, your introduction. You're in California, right? Are you in Petaluma? Or? I am in Petaluma. That's correct. So you're, how far is that from San Rafael? You said you're, you have a practice there? Uh, it's just 20, 20 miles north. Yeah. Okay. It's all beautiful area there. It is. It is lovely. And you are, uh, John Prendergast is a longtime student of non-dual teachings. He studied deeply with Jean Klein and Idea Shanti. And John's the author of a book we're really going to get into today. It's called In Touch. It's a great, that's a great title. It's published by Sounds True. And you're the senior editor of a book I really liked, The Sacred Mirror, Non-Dual Wisdom and Psychotherapy. That was in 2003. And also another book I liked. I think I, think I reviewed both of them. Listening from the Heart of Silence in 2007. And John Prendergast is the editor-in-chief of Undivided, the online journal of non-duality and psychology. And all this can be found at, uh, at your website, listeningfromsilence.com. Um, so I've known you a while, John, and, and um, I mean, I, I see you as kind of a pioneer for a new kind of psychotherapy that bears on non-dual wisdom. Maybe we can get our bearings in the non-dual side of psychotherapy, then get into some of the details of your book in touch. And maybe the way to do that is just to ask what your approach is in the practice of psychotherapy, just broadly speaking. Well, um, kind of to answer it a little bit indirectly, um, I've always been, since my late teens, very interested in contemplative spirituality, and I was a TM teacher for a few years, and then trained as a psychotherapist. So I was very interested to see what was the confluence of these two different traditions, a wisdom tradition, really, of East and West. And uh, my question for many years, I was a transpersonal psychotherapist, was like, how do these go together? And meanwhile, I was studying with Jean Klein for many years, and at some point, very interestingly, the question fell away. It's, it, wasn't, it was no longer how do these go together, but it's like, how can I possibly separate them? And I think what happened is, as there was the recognition, I would say, of um, the awake awareness here, um, there was um, a greater sense of presence and spontaneity in my work with people. And I became very interested in, in um, whether other people were experiencing this and trying to describe it. And as a result, um, you know, started co founded uh, the conference on non dual wisdom and psychotherapy uh, in the late 1990s with Peter Fenner and then went on to develop it. And out of that, the two books that you mentioned came. So, in a simple way, um, I would say it's really sitting with a client. Um, from awake presence. And so the emphasis really isn't on what the apparent problem is or uh, the apparent problem holder is, but really um, intuiting the essential nature or true nature of, of the client and uh, helping them also recognize that. And then from that presence, from that open, empty awareness, um, beginning to welcome their experience, their conditioned experience, whether it's reactive feelings or somatic contractions or um, very limiting beliefs and allowing those to be met with affectionate attention and uh, willingness to let them be as they are. And what happens very beautifully is when our conditioned experience is met with this quality of awareness, it tends to unpack itself uh, in the same way that when we feel um, loved and seen, and accepted just as we are, we tend to relax and unfold. The same is true of our inner experience, our psychological conditioning as well. So this is, I would say, the basic approach that I've been articulating and, and um, you know, a, a group, probably a growing but still small group of psychotherapists have been oriented to as well. And earlier you mentioned you had some questions and you just talked about how the question just kind of resolved or just kind of disappeared mm -hmm. and that kind of resonates with what you just said about uh, 
when you come from a certain presence, I, I can't repeat your words. Uh, I don't know, conflicts perhaps dissolve as well. So there's a certain dis dissolution of um, separation of questions and mm -hmm. and concern that kind of dissolve in, in a in the right atmosphere. That's right. That's really true. And there's been, you know, there's been a kind of historical misunderstanding and trust, I think, between um, at least some spiritual traditions and some psychological traditions. Um, from the psychological side, there's a concern that interest in spirituality is a way of actually avoiding intimacy and dealing with feelings and um, relationships. And from the spiritual side, more, the more contemplative spiritual side, there's been a concern that you can get uh, caught in an endless self-improvement project and um, also stuck in you know trying to work through all your psychological conditioning and, and actually reinforcing it. So each side actually has a legitimate criticism of the other, and I've been been interested in kind of bridging that gap and finding what the common ground is between the, the two these two uh, historical traditions. I can see where that might have been a legitimate uh, concern at one time, but is is it becoming less legitimate? You know, this conflict between what's spiritual and the tools of psychology and, uh, and self-improvement and so on. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you um, increasingly, I think each each domain, um, each tradition is becoming more knowledgeable of the other and also more respectful of their contributions. So, yeah, there's a growing confluence, I would say, that's happening. Yeah. Now, you have a lot of experience and a deep background in the practice of psychotherapy. How, how has it uh, evolved and changed and, you know, what kind of clients are you seeing these days? Well, it's true. It has kind of gradually changed. And I, I find uh, the majority of clients that I work with now are really interested in spiritual unfolding, um, often have very um, deep practices, spiritual practices. And they're also interested in dealing with their more difficult conditioning. Uh, some conditioning falls away pretty quickly as you begin to attune with presence. And other kinds of conditioning, particularly that are rooted in trauma or early ruptures in bonding um, with parents take more time to unwind and often more specialized attention. So, um, you know, I'm with those who are interested in deepening their contact with being, um, I work with those. And for those who have a deep contact with being and want to work through their conditioning um, with more clarity and, and speed, uh, I work with those. So, yeah, increasingly, um, I work with people who uh, are interested in um, presence and um, and embodying that presence in their ordinary life and in their relationships. So it's beautiful. It's really, um, I love working with people who have this deep orientation. Yeah, um, we're going to get into your book, but questions come up, and I and I probably should save them for later. But as you're talking. I'm thinking uh, something that's kind of been um, I'm aware of lately. I don't know if it's, if it's bothered me. Maybe it has, but I'm aware of it. And it's that people who do like non-duality interviews like myself or anyone else who does a lot of them or anyone who's really involved in the day-to-day, -day, who's like almost overly familiar with non-duality, mm -hmm. there becomes almost, it becomes almost too easy. I find that it's almost too easy to do some interviews, like I know the themes so well, I know where they came from, I know where they're going, you know, I know the nuances, I know the subtleties, I know the good questions to ask, I know the deep questions to ask, mm. and it's like, <laughs> it's like big deal, and can we become too, uh, you know, too, too polished in what we do? I'm just think it just occurred to me now. Do you, do you, is it, do you ever think of that? Does it ever come up for you, or, or does the or does the nature of what you do, the presence-centered, um, body-based uh, approach, kind of uh, take care of all that? I think it does take care of that because <clears throat> I, mean, I understand what you're saying, Jerry, that one can get into a kind of um, you know routine, a familiar routine in terms of thinking about this and, and talking about it. <clears throat> it's something else actually to sit with someone and explore their direct experience in the moment because it's very rich, um, it's very unique, 
even though there are general patterns um, that we all share as human beings. And the contact, you know, just the, the, um, the sharing of the presence is very alive and fresh. So I think if we're really, um, you know, the more comfortable we are with the unknown, our willingness to not know in the moment, our willingness to simply rest uh, in awareness and wait, um, the fresher uh, the dialogue becomes. And whatever we're speaking of, whether it's a therapeutic dialogue, whether it's an interview, whether we're in relationship with someone else, it's so easy, isn't it, you know, to get into the, you know, familiar routines and, and um, conceptual frameworks that are we're so comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's why in, in some interviews I like to throw you know a wrench into the works to try to break that. But I don't think I don't think I need to do that in this interview. Uh, you know, unless you want to, that's up to you. Well, no, I... <laughs> it's something in your book. Let's let's look at your book now because now you're talking about uh -huh. your your approach. Now we can look at, at uh, like, go okay. right through your book. You know, it, it and uh, also I want to say your book has a lot of very useful exercises, mm. and if you want to. Try one, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, do an exercise or one or two or more at any point just to jump into it. Okay. If, if you think that's going to be useful in this in this yeah. um, context, I don't know if it is or not. Well, it may or may not. Yeah, it's um, you know, it is. It's one thing to talk about these things, and it's another to experience them firsthand and to experience them deeply. And that's why I actually included the you know these little experiments and inquiries throughout the book. Um, because, you know, if we don't, if we don't really have a direct experience of it, we, um, it remains abstract. So, um, yeah, there may be opportunities during our, if so, yeah, our dialogue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your book is divided into four parts and, um, just going through it, you start out with just view, just the, the a view of the body. Uh, you have a scientific view, you have a more felt sensing view mm -hmm. and that's the first part. And then in the second part. It's called reducing the noise. So we can imagine what the noise is, but you can talk more about that. And then re re reducing the noise, um, uh, you know, could lead to a being with experience or questioning, different questionings. And um, I'm just very briefly going through it. In part three, then once the noise has been reduced and there's a, a, there's more of a being with experience, then there's a hearing. Part three is called hearing the signals, the, the somatic qualities of inner knowing. And there's four of those we can go through those and uh, or, is there, or is there three of them mm -hmm. three or four four of those i think yeah four of them then in part four you know after you've um, you know reduced the noise and heard the signals then there are the there's the fruits of inner knowing self-recognition and this great intimacy so in a few seconds i've just gone through the major themes is that fairly yeah i mean this cursory, is cursory but accurate yeah very accurate and you know the overarching theme here um is one of attunement and um, the role of the body in, in attunement. So, um, you know, what I notice, um, um, <clears throat> and focusing on the sense of inner knowing, um, I think that's what makes this book a little bit different from others, is the body approach, the somatic approach, and the subtle somatic approach, not to mention, you know, working with conditioning, the conditioned body, mind, and, and our ultimate non-dual nature. So I was very, you know, I was very interested in weaving these themes together, and this um, overarching theme of attunement, uh, the body is like, um, in a way, like a musical instrument, and it can be more or less out of tune, and um, and we can be more or less out of tune with it. So um, there's a real value in um, learning how to slow down and actually listen, uh, not just with our ears, but as a kind of metaphor for sensing um, our bodies. So that's right. It's about the sense of inner knowing. Um, how our bodies are uh, actually have a sense of authenticity, uh, realness, of integrity. Uh, we get it. We have a feel for what's real and what's not, and it's often obscured by our either lack of attention or our reactive feelings or our beliefs. So, um, yeah, the first section of, of the book, I, I lay out um, the science of attunement in terms of objective science and what we're learning about. Uh, the importance of being attuned um, internally to our feelings and to our sensations and our interior experience and being attuned with one another um, because uh, children really need to feel attuned 
And if they don't, they start tuning out to themselves and others and have difficulty thriving in life. So uh, there's a lot of interesting neuroscience that's emerging uh, about this, and we don't need to go into it. But um, I felt I wanted to include that in, in the book, um, at least for readers who are more uh, rationally and scientifically oriented to know that um, there is this research emerging about the importance of attunement and deep listening. Yeah, yeah, you did. And, you did. You, you you cited a few of uh, a few studies. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and Dan Siegel's work is really um, a central piece of this. He's a, a neuroscientist and researcher out of UCLA, and is doing a lot of pioneering research on relationship and attunement that fits very well with the theme of my book. And then um, on the subjective side, there's a sense that there's the felt sense, and and this is a, a whole body sense of um, something. It's preverbal. Um, and this was discovered by Eugene Jenlin in the 1960s. He was a um, colleague and co-researcher with, um, and gosh, I'm forgetting his name right now, Carl Rogers. And he discovered, he was researching psychotherapy, and he discovered there were certain uh, clients who were just naturally gifted in tuning in. And they had a, uh, this it's rarely used ability, but it's actually common to everyone, native to everyone, mm-hmm. to be able to listen to subtle sensations in the body and form a sense about a situation or a problem or a person. So he called this felt sensing and developed an approach called focusing, which some of your listeners and perhaps you are familiar with. And it continues to be, um, it was developed in psychotherapy, but it, uh, it's far beyond psychotherapy. And, and <clears throat> the sense of this felt sensing, this capacity for self, felt sensing, I've discovered and others as well, just has a really tremendous range and includes actually our ability to sense what's deeply true, our true nature and what's deeply authentic, both on personal and, <clears throat> excuse me, transpersonal mm-hmm. levels. So um, I discuss that in the book and it's, it's a really important resource. And also um, the subtle body. Um, this is the body of subtle sensation and for whatever reason, this has very, been an area of great interest and, and sensitivity. And I find when I, I sit with people, um, it's, it's very easy to attune and resonate with their inner experience as well. And it's very valuable um, to begin to um, kind of sense into the, the subtler energies and centers um, uh, in the body. So the body is the body's not what we think it is. It's not this dense, heavy um, container. It's actually a, a field of uh, subtle sensation and energy. And some of us have more sensitivity to it than others, and that's that's natural. Um, but um, kind of the more we can sense into the body, the more in touch with ourselves we are. And, and this allows us actually to be more available um, to our I would say our true nature, our, our true undivided nature, or non-dual nature. So, yeah, that's the first section of the book. Interrupt me, throw in a wrench, any point here, Jerry. Well, no, I, it, no, I mean, I mean, you've thrown in your own wrenches in the book. I mean, aside from the subtle, if, if some people are, are um, a little not quite clear on the subtle energies, you, you main, you, you name one of the most obvious ones. You say, you say one of the most. I think I'm quoting you here in my notes. One of the most common forms of experiencing. The energy body is also one of the most painful heartbreak. Mm. So never mind the subtle stuff. I mean, that's the stuff everyone's right. got hit with. Well, that's that's right. Sometime. I mean, yeah, we can feel. You know, any of your listeners, um, almost all of them, have had this experience. You know, of being, um, <clears throat> you know, losing a loved one or having someone leave you that you love in a relationship, and there's this wrenching, uh, kind of sometimes stabbing sensation in the center of the chest. You know, what is that exactly? It's not musculature, you know, it's not, it's not subtle. It's not very subtle in those cases as well. And it's very painful. So these are kind of more accessible examples and we can feel, you know, wrenching in the gut and tightening in the interior of our body. And very often these localize along the midline of the body, deep in the interior and correspond to, um, you know, the, the chakras or energy centers that have been described in yogic and uh, Tibetan traditions as well. So I've noticed 
over the years of working with people that there's a correspondence between um, certain psychological issues and, and contractions or openings in these various ener- energy centers. Yeah, you, so, and you do talk about the chakras, uh, or what you call them also energy centers. You talk about them, uh, all the all the different uh, chakras, and um, you even invo- uh, um, include such topics as uh, um, you associate sensitivity to the chakras with uh, honest self-expression. Uh, of course, love would be mm-hmm. w- wouldn't be a surprising theme. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like the heart center is is involved with self acceptance and self esteem and and um, the ability to receive and give love and uh, experience gratitude and appreciation. So they're like you take one center like the heart, and the more deeply you, you go into it, often um, the earlier you go in terms of psychological material. There's a whole um, personal and egoic level of the heart in terms of how we think and feel about ourselves. And then there's even deeper levels, um, kind of the soul level of our, our own special gifts and our own unique contribution. And beyond that, a kind of universal love. So the heart center is a portal to um, you know unconditional love, and, uh, as an example. Another center that often comes up in my work with people is the root chakra. Know, which has to do with safety and security and you know as conditioned beings we're very oriented to trying to be safe and and also to keep a separate sense of self intact so it can be it's very interesting with pe- working with people who are um, really interested in discovering who they really are very often there's uh, a lot of defense and fear and letting go of of the separate sense of self because it's uh, imagined it's felt to be and often confused uh, as a kind of death, for instance. So there's a lot of a lot of interesting subtleties here in the unfolding, uh, the exploration of our interior experience. And and what's interesting is like all any experience that we have, Jerry, and it, it doesn't matter what it is, can be a portal uh, to discovering who we really are. And so yeah. we, can, we can go deeply into any experience. And, so let's take heartbreak. Someone, you know. Okay. It can be devastating for a person. Some people have to be hospitalized for it. But in, in any case, it could be quite devastating. Mm-hmm. Ha, ha, let's say, how do you go from heartbreak, which is that you know tsunami of uh, energy, to per- perceiving the subtle energies? You know, well, the, 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 yeah, the, the, I, the more mists, you know, go from tsunami to, to a mist of energy. Uh, you know, how, do, how does that transition uh, happen? Well, you begin with where, where you are. It, you know, for instance, with heartbreak, because it is so painful, we tend to avoid it. So we begin to um, approach it rather than avoiding it and begin to tolerate it more. And, you know, that may take a little time um, when it's not quite as raw. But we begin to be curious and approach the sense of heartbreak with affectionate attention and curiosity. We lean into our experience and um, often it will initially intensify. We may feel the pain in the heart. But then, interestingly, when we give attention to something, particularly um, when it's affectionate and curious, of its own, it begins to transform. And so heartbreak will begin, actually, um, it may lead to earlier disappointments and um, wounds uh, emotionally and relationally uh, that we may have experienced. So that might be a a shift that happens. Earlier betrayals may emerge, and we realize there's a whole drawer full of um, heartbreak that's there. And as we tolerate it, and as we begin to feel our way through it, it actually begins to soften. Um, the sharpness of it diminishes, and, and um, there's a kind of a quietness and an openness um, that begins to appear, a tenderness, actually. We begin to feel you know, what it is you know, that was hurt. And we may begin to feel something very tender and very innocent and, and um, actually quite beautiful. Now, and now, now you're, um, John, you're talking about going, I think, going into part two of your book on reducing uh-huh. the noise. Mm-hmm. So um, and you, have, you list a couple of ways, or a few ways of reducing the noise. One, you just talked about being with the experience. 
Mm-hmm. And I'll just quote you from the book. You say, apparent obstacles such as turbulent emotions, which we were just talking about, mm-hmm. and bodily constrictions can become allies, pointing the way to treasures that have been buried and forgotten deep within. And uh, yeah, that's just what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's like we taking the heart, for instance, you know, it, it's so painful um, to be, for instance, rejected or neglected or attacked. We defend our hearts and, and close them. Uh, we, we put on, you know, a certain kind of suit of armor in order to deal with a, a challenging environment in the family or in the world. And then we forget the tenderness and the, the natural innocence and openness that was there. So by willing to kind of go through our defenses, maybe an initial numbness and then uh, a degree of pain that we go through, um, then there's a softening and an opening and we get in touch with the buried treasure, with those essential qualities um, that we were trying so much to uh, protect. Yeah. So this, this happens again and again. So if you go, you know, if you go into a sense of self-loathing, um, for instance, and, and go in with a certain quality of attention uh, and openness, we come to a sense of self-acceptance. You know, and if we if we explore our shame, for instance, um, we'll find our natural innocence. Um, if we go into our fear, we'll discover our natural fearlessness and courage. It's really beautiful um, to discover um, that beneath whatever defenses and wounds that we have, there is this kind of natural radiance, this light awareness that shines through us. And the fear and the defenses and the wound, those all constitute the noise when you talk about in part two of your book, reducing the noise. Yeah, exactly. Because we, um, you know, we tend to avoid it or become absorbed in it. And part of the noise, of course, is our belief systems as well. And often, not, not always, many of our reactive feelings and bodily contractions are related to core limiting beliefs that we have often almost always that we've picked up as children so they're very simple uh, often four to seven words long we can form it in a sentence and and usually related to one of two uh, basic themes one is that i'm deficient uh, or lacking in some kind of essential way or else um, something's really wrong with me i'm flawed so lacking or flawed um, and constitute what I sometimes call the grandmother and grandfather core beliefs. Mm -hmm. So if we can begin to uncover, this is so much part of our own operating system as a separate self, if we begin to recognize those and then question them from the heart, not from an analytic mind, but from our heart wisdom, um, they can begin to soften. How do you question from the heart wisdom? Okay, so I've actually developed a little method, and, and maybe this is something in terms of um, experiential we can do with your listeners right now. Good. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll have to do this in a very abbreviated form, but I would invite your listeners to just um, ask themselves, what do you imagine? What do you think is wrong with you? And just notice what comes up in a very simple way. What do you imagine or think is wrong with you? Keep it very simple. And if you've touched something that's really um, something that you actually believe, and often these are subconscious, you'll feel a kind of contraction, a kind of density, a darkening, uh, a collapsing that goes on. So it's very interesting to first see cause and effect between um, a belief and a contraction. So if, for instance, you have the thought, I'm, I'm worthless, right? Mm-hmm. You'll feel, you know, a closing down, a shutting down, a density. So whatever it may be, something very simple. Mm-hmm. See, if, see if you can formulate that belief. Noticing what the impact is in terms of the body. And then bring your attention to the heart area. Let the belief go. Bring your attention to the heart area. You can do that by imagining that you're breathing directly in and out of the center of your chest. 
And then very innocently ask yourself, what's my deepest knowing about this, about this belief? What's my deepest knowing? But don't go to your mind for an answer. Just let your attention rest in the heart. And it's like throwing a stone in a pond. You just notice the ripples. The answer can, or a response really, more than an answer, um, can come as a, as a slight shift in feeling and sensation. It may come as an image or a memory, or it may come as a simple statement. But we're accessing the heart wisdom, very different from our thinking conditioned mind. What is my deepest knowing? And a, and a variation on this inquiry is, what's, what's really true? What's the deepest mm -hmm. truth? So I was doing um, um, a workshop yesterday and um, was working with this and, and um, people, people reported a feeling like one person said, um, he didn't share what his negative belief was, that he said, I felt like there was more space around it. I wasn't so stuck to the belief. I had some wiggle room, <laughs> which is a nice mm -hmm. description. And another person said, there was a feeling of a light bulb going off in my heart like a sense of illumination and openness. And someone else said, you know, I went to my mind for an answer, and then I realized actually there was a different response happening, a very subtle quality of light than I felt in my heart area. And realized that a whole different response was happening that I was unaccustomed to listening to. So mm -hmm. it's... I don't. Did you um, do you want to report anything that you experienced with this little exercise? Yeah, with the uh, initial invitation, I felt uh, I forget I forget how you worded it. But I felt like kind of an I felt it very bodily, uh, kind of out of sync. I wrote down the words out of sync, and then I got a, a more accurate description. I put down the word unaligned. Unaligned. I felt okay. unaligned, mm -hmm. um, and then when I went to the heart the um you know what's the deepest truth mm -hmm. to me is what's then then was the heart so mm -hmm. and then some alignment then so then the unalignment kind of evaporated it's very interesting isn't it and you it's use like the word alignment i'm using your maybe i'm picking up on your vocabulary too but that's what uh -huh. i felt yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it's very it. effective and very direct yeah it's very direct because we're accessing the heart wisdom which is a very um, a very deep and essential expression of our true nature. And when you meet confusion and misunderstanding, which is what these core limiting beliefs are, with the wisdom of the heart, it begins to yield. It's as if a certain quality of light comes into a dense um, or dark area and begins to illuminate it. It's very interesting. Um, you quote Rupert and, Spira in that sense mm -hmm. of talking about awareness saturating uh mm -hmm. colonizing mm -hmm. yeah a good a good british metaphor conditioning <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i guess I, I i've teased rupert about that a little bit but yeah it's um it's uh it's bringing in you know the light of awareness to these compartmentalized areas and and um letting them unfold in that and you know often it's it's a kind of um, subtle shift that happens and it's you know we'll come we'll have to re repeat this a number of times but there's an important point here that I actually didn't touch on is for your listeners um, as you ask the question what's my deepest knowing or what's really true and you feel some kind of shift or opening um, or some kind of response really take time to let it in it's like um, breathe it in uh, let your body be saturated with this new insight and this new feeling. And by doing so, it's like the body begins to reorient. It reconditions. Um, and it becomes a clearer vessel or vehicle to express our true nature, our true undivided or non-dual nature. And this is a process of embodying our 
understanding. And this is critically important, that we not just get things on the level of the mind, even the awakened mind, but that there's an awakening of the heart and an awakening of the abdomen and, and that our whole body begins to, which is um, very related to our, um, our conditioning and psychology, uh, subconscious psychology, begins to participate in the understanding um, so that we live this in our lives and in our relationships. It's not just something that we know abstractly or experience on the meditation cushion or on retreat as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah, this is, um, this is something, a little method I've developed after many years and, uh, of working with people and it, and it actually works quite beautifully and elegantly. Yeah. It seems to work. It seems powerful. And it's just, a, I guess it's just a small taste of what the kind of stuff you do. Exactly. It's yeah, yeah. a little glimpse of that. And so, in your book, you have a, you have a, a couple of dozen exercises mm -hmm. like that. I guess some are more involved and stuff, but mm -hmm. yeah. You have yeah. Another one, for instance, is we were focusing on beliefs, but um, just in terms of being with sensations and feelings, if you're willing to kind of sense into an uncomfortable feeling or sensation, for instance, um, it's a kind of a leaning into it, but without the intention to change it. This is very important. Because the conditioned mind is very strategic and it will adopt any kind of technique in order to uh, change your one's experience. And or an ulterior, mo ulterior motive. It, there's always an ulterior motive of the conditioned Even mind. Even if you think maybe you don't have it. you know. Even if you think you don't have it. So it, an interesting checking question is to ask, am I willing for this experience to stay the same and never change? Hmm. Right. And then be honest with yourself. So if we have that willingness... To, for our experience not to change and be exactly it as, as it is, then we can actually sincerely meet it intimately with curiosity and affection. And in the same way that people enjoy being met with, with acceptance and curiosity and affection, the same is true of our interior experience. And it just provides an environment. If transformation is going to happen, this is the optimal environment. And so we can breathe a little bit into that difficult experience and we can inquire what's in the very core or center of it and, and just listen and feel. And of its own, uh, it will transform. It's really about being intimate with experience. So if we, if we approach our, our feelings and our sensations, that quality of affectionate attention and, and uh, curiosity, and if we, if we approach our beliefs with an attitude of heartfelt wisdom and inquiry, um, this transformational process will uh, be catalyzed as well. So this is being with experience, and, and this leads us to the next section of the book, which is uh, hearing a signal. Yeah. And so the noise, presumably over time, the noise is gradually reduced. I don't think it's ever completely reduced, um, mm -hmm. but it can diminish, and we can have a quieter, more integrated interior experience. And as we do so, um, and this has been very interesting for me as I've worked with um, people in spiritual mentoring and um, and in psychotherapy, um, these kind of um, kind of classic cluster of essential somatic experiences arise, and um, one of them is an openness of the heart as we get more in touch with our truth and what's really in our integrity and our authenticity. The heart opens more. Um, we just generally feel more grateful and appreciative, and we can feel a kind of radiance in the center of our chest. So it's subtle, but it's palpable as well. Mm -hmm. um, we can feel another quality that um, I've noticed, and of course you read about in the book, is the quality of deeper groundedness. And we just become more relaxed in the, in the core of the body, and uh, attention drops down and, and there's a sense of greater stability, um, both relative stability, um, but interestingly, as our sense of ground opens, it becomes less localized as a space beneath the body and, and actually becomes global. We feel it all around and we can, become a, we can sense it as a, we can speak poeti poetically of it as a groundless ground as well. So <clears throat> this is something else. People just, when they get in touch with the truth, they tend to feel more grounded. Um, they feel more inwardly aligned. They just, they feel, um, 
as I mentioned in my book, very interesting. When people get in touch with their truth, they send a sit up um, upright. <laughs> yeah. In, in a relaxed way, not a forceful way. Yeah. But, but it's like uh, the truth sits us up and it lines us up. The more in our own natural integrity we are. Um, and, and also there's a sense of aliveness that comes with that. So, you know, this, this is fairly subtle um, sensory stuff and, and not all of us are going to be feeling that. But we just may feel more alive, more vibrant. Does that make sense then when, you know, you hear people say, you know, follow your, uh, follow your bliss, follow your dream, follow your excitement. Does it make sense to, to say follow your aliveness? Yes, when, when, it does. Pe when people are, you know, not sure, you know, where their life's going. I, I think so. Or they're at a transition time, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, follow what's, what's truly alive. And what's, I, I do make a distinction between aliveness and excitement. And excitement yeah. is, you know, uh, it's great to, we can be excited about many things and um, it's, it's fun to be excited about something and we can get excited about delusions. <laughs> we can, yeah. uh, you know, get, uh, get our buttons pushed and, or, or stimulated and get very excited about people who agree or disagree with us. And, and so there's a different quality. I, I distinguish aliveness from this excitement. Aliveness we, is quieter and we feel it in the core of our being. And it really is independent, uh, increasingly, of any kind of circumstances. Um, so uh, we feel it, it's, it. We feel it just about life itself, a kind of core or essential aliveness. And so that that is really um, a very important quality to pay attention to. Something is in a deep, quiet way, really, really alive uh, for us, and that it feels in our integrity as well. Francis Lucille talks about says uh, talks about following your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very similar in yeah. the sense you know the the root of enthusiasm is the word theos or God. So um, you know there's something deeply inspiring, something that really is nourishing to us in a deep way, not in a superficial way. Uh, that's something to to really follow, and and this is you know I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because. Um, the subtitle of the book is, is um, how to tune into the inner guidance of your body and trust yourself, and um, which was a <clears throat> actually I would have subtitled the book differently as the sense of inner knowing. It sounds too like you know a handle of how to do this and get something. But um, the point is is that we do have an inner guidance system, and it's true on a relative level. Uh, we can feel what's authentic, and <clears throat> if we tune in, and we can just feel inclined. To move in a certain direction, uh, even if it's mm -hmm. unfamiliar. And then we also have a sense of what's most deeply true, uh, what's most deeply authentic about who we really are as pure being or pure consciousness as well. And interestingly, our body, you know, um, responds and has a sense of that as well. So we can be enthusiastic about certain um, forms of expression in our life, you know, things that we'd love to do, like Francis wants to play tennis, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's an enthusiastic tennis player. We're, we're old friends from the Jean Klein days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but he has a deep enthusiasm for true nature and, mm -hmm. you know, teaches beautifully uh, about that as well. And, and so this is, um, this is true for all of us. We have these, this deep, uh, deep intuition of what's alive for us. And all of these, uh, one point I want to uh, make that I think is really important it's not about cultivating the qualities of trying to be more open-hearted or trying to be more grounded or more aligned or more spacious, which is for fourth quality. It's more as we attune with who we really are, these qualities begin to naturally appear. And they just let us know we're on the right track um, because they're, they're essential qualities. They're byproducts, I would say, of our true nature. And so um, they're pointers. And, and uh, that's why I use the metaphor of trail markers or cairns. These are subtle bodily markers, and they're, they're complementary to certain essential emotions, such as gratitude and appreciation and courage uh, that emerge. All of these spontaneously radiate out of our true nature or being. So they're, they're homing or honing signals uh, that let us know that we're in the right direction. And that's important because we can be so easily seduced by our thinking and by our minds. 
And I think that's probably why um, I emphasize this as I do, because um, I've had such a strong analytic and uh, skeptical mind. It's been really helpful to include the body um, in terms of uh, the development of self-trust and, and trust of inner authority as well. So that's one of the main themes of my book as well, is, is developing that sense of trusting ourselves and that there is this inner knowing, which is the real teacher. Um, and any, mm -hmm. any outer teacher is, um, is in touch with that inner teacher and points us to it. I really like the, uh, I guess what I resonate with most with of the uh, four somatic qualities, again, with going through them again, uh, groundedness, uh, inner alignment, open-heartedness, and the fourth one was uh, was um, the sp space, spaciousness. Space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we get a sense of, uh, again, quoting from your book, we get in touch with our, when we get in touch with our inner knowing, there's often a sense of vast space within and around our bodies and this subjective sense of space is almost always accompanied by a deep silence. Mm, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, openness, spacious awareness, um, a profound, vibrant silence as well. You talk about the sense of spacious awareness being contagious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's true. It. Um, if and and I mentioned in the book, it's just like when I the first time I met both of my main teachers, uh, Jean Klein and Adyashanti, um, without having any direct verbal or visual contact, just sitting, you know, in in proximity to them, there was immediately a sense of um, this vibrant silence and presence. So it's this sense of space is is not just individual. Uh, it's 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 a kind of shared space or shared ground um, that we all have, and as we really uncover um, all these misidentities, all this mistaken identity of who we thought we are, and open increasingly to the unknown and the unfamiliar, uh, we find ourselves in presence, and and this presence is a contagious ease. Uh, we're not intending. To influence others, but it's uh, in the field and it's felt. Mm. So it's very interesting. A contagious just, ease. It's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty cool. It is. Yeah. But we got a few minutes left. And uh, the fourth part of your book is the fruits, the fruits of, of inner knowing now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you want to, you mentioned yeah. self recognition. Another title you have is, is a Great Intimacy. Well, this is, uh, this is it. You know, I'm, um, the the recognition the, these these four somatic qualities that often uh, appear are pointing us to discover who we really are and this is sometimes called awakening i prefer to call it self-recognition it's just a, a realizing that we're not who we took ourselves to be none of our thoughts none of our stories none of our history confines or defines who we really are we are this open empty vibrant where being and this is very a very profound very transformative discovery um, accompanied with a sense of great freedom um, and inner peace and this is the beginning of a whole nother unfolding of development of understanding <clears throat> that not only is our true nature pure consciousness but so is everything else an expression of pure consciousness and and as is the body so um, not, our, not only are we this open, free expression, um, but everything and everyone around us is as well. And this brings a feeling of just growing um, intimacy, growing intimacy with our own experience and intimacy with others uh, as well. The, the separate self, the, it, it's interesting because um, there are many kind of layers of the separate self. There's a a mental layer in terms of our images and our stories. There's an emotional layer of feeling and an instinctual level um, of body identification. Uh, and as we more deeply recognize who we are, as we more deeply awaken, the body becomes more transparent and illumined. And our experience of the world transforms. It becomes less and less something separate or divided and more and more 
uh, a sense of being um, ourself. Everything is ourself as well. And so it, it brings a sense of, it, it's really the, the opening of, of love and, and the knowing of, um, of what we call our surroundings or environment uh, as, a, as a beautiful and intim- intimate expression of that. So I think this is native to all of us. Uh, this is our true nature. And uh, we're actually equipped internally um, to discover this and to embody it as well. So there's a, it's important that we awaken and recognize who we are. And then it's equally important that we embody this in our ordinary daily life. And those are what the last two chapters are about. Yeah, and you say... Um... We discover what I like to call, and this is you writing, we discover what I like to call the sacred ordinary. Mm. We feel grateful for no reason. Mm, yeah. <laughs> that, that's nice, isn't it? Because it's not about being extraordinary in any way. It's not about having extraordinary experiences, although those can sometimes happen. There are epiphanies and um, you know, dramatic experiences um, that can happen. But it's really realizing that um, our very ordinary lives, our very ordinary relationships are suffused with this light of pure awareness. And, and um, so there's a feeling of sacredness to our, our ordinary life and, and um, just a, a profound sense of gratitude to, to be alive. Uh, whatever our life, however it manifests, just the fact of our aliveness and our awareness is, is a reason to be grateful. Thank you. John Prendergast. I think, you know, I think you put, you put everything into your book. I think I've read all your books. You put everything into them, mm. which you've done in this book, In Touch. Mm, thank you. And uh, you are an authority in this presence-centered, body-based psychotherapy. And I, and I would imagine that, that, this, that your book, In Touch, is probably must-reading for anyone who's inclined to toward the uh, psychotherapy approach that you describe. I mean, what if a person wants to get trained in... Well, we do have, um, um, you know, in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's probably the, you know, the epicenter, uh, if you'll pardon the earthquake metaphor, uh, of interest in, in, you know, this confluence. And so we do, there are workshops in uh, the California Institute of Integral Studies um, does have, um, you know, a couple of professors where I used to teach who, or at least one, um, who has this orientation. You know, there are graduate schools in the Bay Area and there is a community of therapists uh, who have this approach. So um, this would probably be the most fruitful area if someone's really interested in in training uh, in this approach. Thank you, John Prendergast. Listeners could find out more about your book, your journal, your workshops, and your your counseling if they'll visit your your website, listeningfromsilence.com. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And retreat. Uh, I'm doing some retreats, um, one in January, residential retreat in the Valley, and I'll be doing a five-day workshop at Esalon next May uh, as well. Thank you very much. Uh, It's been a real pleasure to speak with you, Jerry. Nice to reconnect. I I want to express my my appreciation that you, you know, that you took the time to read through the book and, and gave us time to, you know, unpack it a bit as well. So, um, yeah, it was really, really an excellent interview. I appreciate it. Okay. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. And that was my conversation with Dr. John Prendergast, a retired professor of psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies and a psychotherapist in private practice in San Rafael, California. Everything you need to know about John, you can find from his website, listeningfromsilence.com. Mainly, we talked about his new book, In Touch, How to Tune In to the Inner Guidance of Your Body and Trust Yourself. This has been Non-Duality Talk. Our website is nonduality.org. I'm Jerry Katz. Thank you for listening.